Hi, and welcome everybody to this 70th episode of the REBT Advocates with Dr. Michael R. Edelstein of 3MinuteTherapy.com, psychologist extraordinaire in San Francisco Bay Area, and me, Tommy Bateman. I'm but a lowly counselor in the Richmond, Virginia area. But today, we're here to welcome the highly esteemed Dr. Cohn, Elliot Cohn, who has a different middle initial from the other Elliot Cohns out there. Michael, why don't you tell us about him? Okay, thanks, Tommy. Thanks for the introduction. Uh, before I get to Dr. Cohn, I just wanted to remind our viewers that next week, we'll be interviewing Dr. Warren Farrell, author of many best-selling books, but the, most, the latest is The Boy Crisis and uh, how uh, our boys are being treated and the ramifications of that. So uh, tune in next time to learn more about that. Uh, Dr. Cohn is an author, professor, a blogger. His latest book is Making Peace with Imperfection, a great book on REBT, which we'll be talking about. And of particular interest to me, and maybe we could discuss a little later, is that Dr. Cohn is the founder of Philosophical Counseling and Logic-Based Therapy, of which I'm not familiar, so uh, maybe later, Dr. Cohn, you could tell us something about it. So would you want to start by giving us a brief summary of your book? Yeah, um, the book is on uh, demanding perfectionism, what I call demanding perfectionism, which I distinguish from, and I don't do this in the book, but this is plays in the background, uh, aspirational perfectionism, where um, in aspirational perfectionism, one aspires to uh, reach idealistic goals, but one doesn't demand that one actually reach them. Uh, in contrast, Demanding perfectionism involves actually demanding that one uh, attain one's ideals. And um, linked to this uh, form of, of, uh, of demand of perfectionism are both psychological as well as physical disabilities, um, very prominent uh, uh, in the list for mental disabilities uh, are major depression and anxiety. Uh, anxiety disorders, physical health, um, you know, have anything from fibromyalgia to uh, the chronic fatigue syndrome. Um, there's, there's problems with irritable bowel syndrome, eating disorders such as anorexia nervosa, high blood pressure, cardiovascular disease, uh, ulcerative colitis, heart attacks. Even uh, earlier mortality has been linked to demanding perfectionism or what I'm calling it. So it's, it's a very serious uh, issue with, with the implications for both uh, physical as well as uh, psychological problems. And in the book, I distinguish between 10 different types. Uh, just very briefly, I'll just uh, mention approval uh, perfectionism, achievement perfectionism, moral perfectionism, treatment perfectionism, control, Perfectionism, certainty, ego-centered, existential, expectation, and neatness perfectionism. So there's a number of different chapters, uh, 10, dif uh, 10 different chapters uh, that are addressed to each of those specific types of perfectionism. Okay, that's really okay, cool. Very so good. You're, you're really speaking the, uh, oh, go ahead, Michael. You're speaking the REBT language is all I'm going to say first. Michael, go for it. All right. Yeah, I, I wanted to add to what Tommy just said, and that is it was a real pleasure and delight to read the book. Actually, I read most of it, not entirety, because uh, we're on the same page 99.9% .9 of the time and uh, on REBT. And for our new viewers, REBT is Rational Emotive Behavior Therapy, founded by Albert Ellis. Uh, so, uh, so I thought that was great. I highly recommend the book, Making Peace with Perfection and uh, with Perfectionism. And uh, I, I think, Elliot, you touch on many, many different topics that I haven't seen in other books by, about REBT. So I thought that was great. Mm -hmm. uh, another thing I liked about a number of things that especially stood out for me was one you mentioned, you encouraged shooting for the stars. And a lot of CBT therapists recommend uh, if you're anxious, maybe your goals are too high. And we RBT therapists know 
It's not having high goals, like you say, Elliot, shooting for the stars, but it's adding a demand, making it absolute. I absolutely must achieve what I'm shooting for. Otherwise, shooting for the stars is a motivator. Um, did you want to comment further on that, Elliot? Well, that's exactly right and well put. Um, it, it isn't uh, the, the how, how aspirational you are. I mean, that, that can be exciting. Uh, it's whether you demand, you know, that you, you actually achieve those goals. That's what creates the stress. It, it's the, the, the idea it can be very exciting that you, you, the sky's the limit and you can see yourself as improving, making, making progress towards that goal without saying, you know, I must achieve it. That's where the uh, stress comes in. Right, right. Another thing that I liked in particular about your book and that I learned from that I hadn't thought of uh, very carefully before is you differentiate in terms of a goal, unconditional life acceptance for, and versus unconditional world acceptance and uh, life accept. Do you, so do you want to say something about the difference? Yeah, um, you, you can, uh, you can uh, actually reject uh, your life um, uh, without rejecting the world. The world is good. It's just my life is crappy. And, uh, and conversely, uh, so these are, are not the same things. And so the, uh, the, the um, what I call the guiding virtue of, of getting out of uh, global damnation, damning the world, uh, is, is to uh, accept uh, unconditionally uh, the world itself. Um, the world is, 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 is okay. Um, there might be some bad things in it, but that doesn't mean the, the world itself is bad. And, and um, oh, unconditional life acceptance is the, the antidote uh, for uh, damnation of, of, of one's life. One, one's, one's life stinks. It's worthless. Uh, but, you know, there are some uh, crappy things in people's lives, but that doesn't mean they're totally, you know, unconditionally worthless. That's right. And the worst thing is when people have demands on both, they demand that the world be perfect around them and that they demand that their life be perfect, both of which is highly unrealistic. Mm -hmm. Tommy, did you want to get a word in or question in edgewise? Otherwise, I could go on for a couple hours. Yeah. And I'm sure um, uh, uh, we already know the answer and I'm sure regular listeners already know the answer. And I think RBT and you probably agree. Um, but what makes uh, perfection or perfectionism, I should say perfectionism, so odious, so bad in, uh, with your approach? What makes, it, what makes it so bad is it just destroys people's lives. Um, it, it's in the book, I compare it to an addiction. Mm -hmm. um, in, in addictions, uh, people base, base their life around the addiction. Uh, if, you're, if you're an alcoholic or uh, you're addicted to a drug, uh, your life uh, revolves around, uh, you know, what, you know, what happens with whether, whether you, who you associate with, uh, when you do things, um, your, your work life suffers and your personal life suffers. All the same kinds of things can happen with demanding perfection. Uh, and, and there's denial too, you know, a, deni a, a lot of people say I'm a perfectionist and they wear it like a badge. You know, they think it's, it's a great thing. So they don't even know that what they're considering to be a great thing is what's destroying their, their relationships, what's, what's interrupting their professional life and causing them, uh, as I mentioned, uh, not just psychological distress, but also uh, physical problems. Excellent. So I have a question. I have a question to follow up with that. Um, so I am part of a fraternity, or I was part of a fraternity in college called Theta Chi Epsilon in Emory and Henry College. And on our um, crest, we had this thing called the uneven mantle which was uh, kind of a frilly design that was, you know, oblong, it's not, wasn't symmetrical at all. And really what that stood for for us, and tell us where we went wrong, if we did, or praise us if we went right, was this represented the pursuit of perfection while absolutely knowing we could never get there. Were we wrong? No, no. <laughs> you happen to luck out in joining a, a uh, you know, a, a society there that, that actually uh, got it right. All right. Actually, yeah, actually right. they all had been patients of Albert Ellis. That's true. Um, on, that, on that note, Dr. Cohn, uh, you talked about aspirational perfectionism, which uh, Tommy called uh, shooting 
to be perfect or act perfectly and demanding perfectionism. Um, I would put it a little differently and I wonder what you think about this. And I, um, I think this is the way Albert Ellis differentiated the two also. And that what you call aspirational perfectionism is what Tommy mentioned as trying to act perfectly. And that's a high goal, which is very good, even though you're never going to achieve it. And demanding perfection is perfectionism. Uh, the ism is the doctrine of demanding perfection. So, so I would call it aspirational, aspiring toward perfection versus demanding perfection, which leads to perfectionism. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Um, the literature um, actually uh, in, at times distinguishes between two types of perfectionism, healthy versus unhealthy. And so uh, I can see the logic for just calling perfectionism. In fact, in the book, I don't make that distinction. I talk about, you know, healthy, healthily shooting for the stars without demanding it. And then demanding, you know, demanding perfection, you know, as a form of perfectionism. So actually in the book, I, I don't make that distinction. Uh, but I think it's useful to uh, uh, key it into some of the uh, literature, you know, that's out there. On okay. study perfection. Yeah, uh, I see. Yes, that makes sense. I, had, I wasn't aware of that. Uh, now, would you agree that although you mentioned different kinds of perfectionism, uh, moral and neatness and achievement, that there are many other kinds of perfectionisms people have, such as... Uh, being perfect at doing therapy. When they learn REBT, they think I must be perfectly rational. Comfort perfectionism, I must be perfectly comfortable. I must be perfectly financially secure. I must have a uh, guarantee. I'm perfectly free of germs and on and on and on. Uh, I believe that, that all of those could be linked to specific types of generic perfectionism that um, I talked about in, in the book. Uh, I must be, you know, you know, perfect in, in REBT is a form of achievement perfectionism. Um, if if uh, I must be comfortable, um, could be a form of existential perfectionism. There shouldn't be any kind of discomfort in the world. Um, and so I, I think that, um, they are, you know, uh, instances of the generic types of perfectionism that I distinguish in the book. Now, that isn't to say that there aren't other types of perfectionism that may warrant, you know, their own category or classification. Um, indeed, there probably are. I, I try to, uh, through, you know, my, my clinical work to key into what I thought were the ones that I've, you know, seen rather frequently uh, in, you know, in the, uh, you know, in the clinic. So that's, that's how that happened. <laughs> I say, yeah, very good answer. So the thing, the perfectionisms I mentioned could be seen as subheadings under your larger headings of types of perfectionism. Sure. That makes a lot of sense. Tommy? Well, um, I wanted to take a step back to the bigger picture or a bigger picture, something that, um, and go to the thing you founded, um, philosophical counseling mm -hmm. in, 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 in total. Um, so we kind of explained on this, on this show that uh, REBT is a very didactic type form of therapy. We're teaching, we're giving homework. We're not necessarily getting into the nitty, like when I say nitty gritty, going back into the past and getting into the real deep experience, traumatic experiences or things like that, asking about their relationship with their mother because we're focused on the problem at hand, right? Mm -hmm. it, is, is philosophical counseling mirroring that or does it look very similar to that? Uh, how does it? How does a session work with a philosophical counselor? Yes, and how is it different from REBT Indeed. in particular? Okay, well, those are those are excellent questions. Um, yeah, um, the, there's different type, different modalities of uh, approaches. Let's say to philosophical counseling, the form of philosophical counseling that I use uh, grew out of the work that I did with Albert Ellis. So uh, it was obvious. It's obviously. Uh, oriented towards the present, doesn't, you know, deal with past uh, situations directly. Um, as far as philosophical counseling is concerned, um, you see, um, philosophical counseling has been, uh, we, we actually, if with the National Philosophical Counseling Association, we certify philosophers to do 
philosophical counseling. And because they're philosophers, uh, they're, they're not qualified uh, actually to, to do uh, counseling that, that involves uh, different types of, of, uh, of classification, DSM you know, classifications of mental disorders. So they do consulting. And so it's limited to specific uh, problems of life, whether a person has uh, a, uh, a block uh, in, in terms of writing, writer's block, or, or they have uh, some other kinds of uh, issues. So it's, 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 uh, th then, then also philosophical counselors could also be psychological counselors, and we certify them, but they're free to do other forms of counseling with you know, mental, uh, you know, mental disorders. So are you saying that philosophical counseling is, is based in REBT, but it focuses on more, spe more specifically on uh, some areas of one's life, but not all as REBT does? Well, yeah, for, for purposes of philosophers, uh, actually, with PhDs in philosophy doing, doing philosophical counseling, uh, they don't, you know, they focus on specific problems of living and on, this, on the website we publish a whole list of different problems and, and then they learn you know, different, different signs of uh, clinical signs that they need to refer uh, their um, clients instead of you know, working with them. So, right, and it's, is logic-based therapy uh, pretty much synonymous with philosophical counseling or is that somewhat different from philosophical counseling and REBT? Well, um, I, I distinguish between logic-based therapy and logic-based consulting. And really the only difference there between the two is that logic-based consulting uh, just works with specific problems of living and not, not mental disorders. Um, oh, but you could, you could use logic-based um, therapy uh, in the same way you can use um, REBT. Uh, now, what are the, some of the differences? Well, I think it's, it's more in terms of, of refining certain philosophical aspects of, of REBT than, than being you know, a different uh, theory in, in and of itself. Uh, as you know, Al was very much into philosophy and uh, tried to, to utilize philosophical constructs in developing his theory. Well, logic-based therapy does the same thing, but uh, whereas Al came at it from a psychologist's perspective, I'm coming at it from a philosopher's perspective. So I'm giving um, more uh, input in the philosophical dimensions. And if you like, I could give you some examples of how that is the case. Okay, certainly. Uh, before you do, I, just to help clarify uh, the, the difference between logic-based therapy and the other two, uh, is it what I call dealing with people's practical problems, that would be logic-based therapy, versus dealing with people's emotional problems. And I teach my clients the problem separation technique, separate emotional problems, mean, meaning emotional disturbance, from practical problems, which means problems of daily living and things they can do practically to improve on that. Well, that's a the reasonable distinction, um, but even in practical problems, people confront emotional problems. They're anxious right. about a about a, pro, a practical problem. They're yes. very deeply saddened by it. So we, we can't completely sever those connections. Yes, uh, and you wanted to give some examples of was it of logic based therapy? Yeah, logic-based therapy uses a six-step approach. Um, the first step in logic-based therapy is to identify the emotional reasoning. So there's, you know, respect to emotions. And emotional reasoning is um, basically what Aristotle called practical syllogisms. A practical syllogism is a deductive argument with two premises that has a conclusion that... Um, uh, prescribes. So, for instance, if I said, I'm, uh, I'm, I failed uh, my, in my job, I got fired. Uh, if I failed in my job, then I'm worthless. The conclusion of that syllogism would be, I'm worthless. So, um, LBT analyzes, actually translates the ABC theory of, of, of Ellis into uh, premises and conclusions. 
So that's one way in which logic and philosophical methodologies key in because once you uh, see people's belief systems in terms of, of inferences, then you can examine premises and uh, look for the basis of those premises and look for fallacies in the inherent in those premises and so forth. Right. Okay, very good. Um, I had a, a, a fundamental question about what, what you address in your book, Making Peace with Imperfection, and that is, is it your contention, Dr. Cohn, that all problems, all emotional problems come from demanding uh, being perfect or acting perfectly, uh, or because I see non people have non-perfectionistic demands also, uh, for example, demanding that I do something totally, or demanding I be outstanding but not perfect, or demanding I uh, be very good, or even average, or adequate, or even passable. I've had clients who have demanded that they get at least a C in the course, uh, which I wouldn't call perfectionism. So, so uh, would you agree with that, or do you see it as all based in perfectionism? Well, I, I see. I see that um, that makes makes sense to me. Um, that uh, I, I suspect there's some demandingness and perfectionism going on. Uh, even there, that oh, I, I think so too. I think so too. You yeah, must well, well, always get a C, one hundred percent of the time. Get a C. You must always be adequate, or you know, so so, but always one hundred percent of the time. Yeah, I think that's that, that's, that's, that's unspoken. That's what I called uh, totalism yeah. rather than perfectionism. I must do it totally at each course. Get at least a C, but not necessarily perfectly. Yeah, I mean, it's. It, I guess it's. It's sort of how one one looks at it. Uh, I mean, we could interpret it uh, differently uh, from different perspectives. Is it a? Is it a? Is it a perfectionistic demand that I? I never uh, get anything below a C, or uh, is it uh, just a? You know, a universal absolutistic claim. Uh, perfection it, it, in that respect. Um, one of the things it would share with perfectionism is the absolutism. Right. Oh, absolutely, so to speak. <laughs> um, another question about your book, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, in my therapy, and also in my book, Three Minute Therapy, I emphasize the, the importance, I think it's one of the most important things we teach, the importance of reinforcement, repetition, review, practice, questioning, challenging, and contradicting our demands over and over again, ad nauseum, uh, in order to continue to make inroads in them. And uh, do you have a section on that, or how do you feel about that? Yeah, um, in the book, um, it, what's, it, we, we talk about the, I talk about the um, refutation of uh, faulty thinking. And uh, there's also the, the sixth step of, of LBT is a, is a behavioral step, essentially. Uh, the fifth step uh, finds a philosophical perspective uh, that uh, can help to counteract uh, the, uh, the faulty thinking. So if I'm demanding uh, perfection uh, that I must, must control, be in perfect control, then um, I could use a philosophical perspective uh, such as uh, Epictetus, uh, who, who says that you should not try to control things that you you can't control, you know, that are outside of your control. So if I'm a perf approval perfectionist and I'm demanding approval, uh, then I could uh, you know, cite uh, Epictetus and then I can ask, well, what would Epictetus do differently than what I'm doing? So what, what, is my what is my behavioral responses right now when I demand approval and I don't get it? How do I act? What do I do? Uh, what would Epictetus tell us to do differently? Would he tell us to, to whine and soak? Uh, uh, you know, one's head or um, act differently. And obviously he would. Okay. Okay. Very good. Good explanation. Tommy, will you, did you want to get in there? Yeah. Um, no, just uh, slightly changing it, but staying on the uh, thing of perfection. I like to go on tangents here. My question is, uh, does LBT or um, philosophical counseling have a position? Because REBT, I don't think necessarily does have a position on this, though REBT therapists may, um, is the question, does perfection exist to begin with? Um, 
it, it doesn't, it, well, uh, <laughs> as a philosopher, this is, this is a, a big issue, <laughs> but <Yeah. laughs> uh, from, from different philosophical perspectives, it, it, it may exist, but not, not a here on earth. Um, for instance, Plato said that there's perfection, but it exists in the kind of heaven of ideas. Mm -hmm. But, but the, the things on earth are, you know, perishable, changeable, uh, and, and not perfect at all. Uh, but that's the world we must reckon with in every day. Excellent. Life. And, and, I, I, I agree. Before you uh, give your rejoinder, Tommy, I just want to say I agree perfectly with that. And uh, because no matter what we have in our life or what we have in the world, with a good imagination, we could always imagine somehow it would be better. Uh, so in that sense, I don't think there's perfection in people, in the world, in life, anything like that. Tommy? I'm religious. What can I say? But um, my question for you, and this is just, you only get one word, one word answer for this one. Plato or Aristotle? <laughs> all, all hinges on this for me. Aristotle. Oh, that's my man. Okay, good. I'm sorry. Carry on. Carry on. <laughs> for, right. for me, between Plato and Aristotle, I'll take Albert Ellis. All right, whatever. <laughs> And that's more than one word. Thank you. Okay. Uh, another <laughs> question, and that is, um, you quote uh, Nietzsche in the book, a uh, mm -hmm. statement about unconditional life acceptance, and he says, embrace your fate. Now, um, being a stickler for use of words, uh, it seems to me that we wouldn't exactly say embrace your fate, because embrace uh, is positive, it means when you embrace someone, you have infection, affection for them. Or when you embrace something, if you embrace an idea, you like the idea, you feel positively about that. And uh, there are certain aspects of your fate that you may not want to embrace in that sense. Uh, uh, Elliot, did you have a thought about that? Um, well, um I think I think what we could do is substitute uh, for embrace, uh, accept the challenge, you know, of your fate. Uh, right. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and then another question uh, that has come up with clients with me, and I was wondering how you respond when it comes up with you. And that is, they say, uh, I'm doing three minute exercises and they are, they are writing them out. Yet I'm still anxious, I'm still depressed. I'm sure you've come across that. And uh, uh, by the way, by three minute exercises, it's just what I call the A, B, C, D, E, F mm -hmm. that you referred to earlier. I'm doing them, yet I'm still anxious, I'm still depressed, and I have various ways to address that. Uh, and uh, would you, Elliot? Uh, do I do 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 I have ways of of addressing that? that? Yeah. How do you address that when a client says that? Well, when a client says that, well, I mean, there's there's obviously one has to work on it cognitively and behaviorally, and uh, you, you just can't instantly um, expect the changes without the practice. So, and um, there's where Aristotle comes in too, because um, we talk about you know building rational habits and and virtuous habits and uh, habits are acquired through practice and habits involve cognition and they involve emotion and they involve behavior. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's lots of stuff we can do applying different R REBT techniques, anything from rational motive, be at rational motive imagery to, uh, to shame attacking exercises. But um, uh, certainly when, when a client, you know, says, well, you know, I understand this. I, I understand where my, my fallacies are. I understand, you know, where I am thinking rationally, but now I still fail this way. Um, LBT talks about cognitive dissonance. And cognitive dissonance is it's oftentimes viewed as being negative, but actually it's progress because a client comes to realize, you know, where they're, they're thinking irrationally. And that's, you know, if, if you, what an analogy is if you're fixing plumbing and uh, you can't fix it unless you know where the leak is and effectively cognitive dissonance 
you know, you still have the leak, but you, you know where it is now. And I like that a lot. Okay, very good, very good. Okay, and uh, Tommy, did you have any last comments before we wrap it up? Uh, other than that, I'm extremely intrigued by your work and I need to delve in more to it. So thank you so much for coming on the show. Michael, do you have any last thoughts or excuse me, Elliot, do you have any last thoughts before we uh, wrap this up? Because we only have a couple minutes. Well, I enjoyed it very much. It's a pleasure. Uh, I appreciated the questions. So. Yeah. It's, uh, um, we haven't spoken like this before and it's, uh, it's a delight to speak to someone <laughs> with such a similar view of philosophy and therapy. Uh, so I just want to remind our audience, Dr. Elliot Cohn is author of Making Peace with Perfection, and uh, the subtitle is Discover Your Perfectionism Type, End the Cycle of Criticism, and Embrace Self-Acceptance. I'll put and an Elliot, Amazon link in the uh, description, folks. Uh, Elliot, did you uh, have any other links you'd like Tommy to put on uh, below the video? Well, if, if uh, others, if, if your audience would like to learn more about philosophical counseling, we could have spent a long time talking about it, um, and that would be a subject in and of itself. Uh, they could uh, key into uh, NPC uh, and, okay. uh, and there's, there's differences. There's, there's a section there on what philosophical practice is, how, it dis how it's distinguished from psychological practice and, and other, other areas, and what, what philosophical practitioners do versus what uh, psychologists may do, um, and so on. Okay, great, wonderful. Thanks for being our guest, Elliot. Good luck with your book, Making Peace with Perfection. Thank you and, so much. And uh, for those of you who enjoyed the interview, please comment below, ask questions, give us your reactions, and also give us a like and subscribe to the REBT Advocates to stay on the rational side of life.